Hello Ebenezer Baptist Church and friends, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. I'm back here again in the church, the roadworks are carrying on, but never mind. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you Lord for your word, for the blessings that it gives us. Lord, for the holy hope that we have, trusting in you. Lord, we ask that you would build up our faith, you would make us men and women of strong faith, to be able to resist the world, Lord to be able to put forth your glory, your gospel message, to be great defenders of the faith as the person we are about to look at uh, was. The Lord, we thank you for his example and the example of all your saints, all through the ages that testify of you. We ask this in your blessed, wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight we are in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 6 verses 8 through to 15 Acts chapter 6 verses 8 through to 15 and he says there and Stephen full of faith and power did great works and miracles among the people then there arose certain of the synagogue which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and came upon him, and caught him, and brought him to the council, and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against, the holy, against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So tonight we're learning about the first martyr, Stephen. <clears throat> Stephen was also the first deacon, as we see there at the start of our, 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 our portion of scripture. Uh, well, we see all the way back, uh, in verse 5, and the, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Bucurus, and Icana, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, uh, a proselyte of Antioch. But notice how Stephen is at the start, and there's things mentioned about him uh, being a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and then just a list of the other ones. So there was something particular about Stephen, as we'll see as we go through. He was also the first martyr. We see that later on at the end of end of chapter 7. But Stephen was also what today we would call a layman. He was uh, not a member of the, of the clergy. He was not a pastor. He was not ordained. But he, he did speak the word of God. He did preach the message. Uh, and, and he was an extraordinary layman. He was a great defender of the faith, a great servant of God. And his name, Stephen, just like mine, <laughs> means to be crowned. Um, I've told my wife that before, and she says that means to be crowned across the head and back of the head, which uh, sometimes happens. But it means to be crowned. And we can see why Stephen was called that, because of his great faith. Remember I told you that uh, most of the names in the Bible have another meaning. They, have, they mean something. They're given to the people for a reason, not just offhanded as as we do today. Well, note these facts about him. He was a man full of faith. He says there in verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on, sorry, chapter, <laughs> chapter 6, verse 8, and Stephen full of faith. He was full also of the Holy Spirit. We said there in verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. Because we see there in verse 5, uh, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. He was full of grace. He was full of power. It says there in verse 8, and Stephen full of faith and power. He was full of wisdom. Because in verse 10, they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He was a man of, of, of a great reputation. Verse 3 says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. So he had a good reputation amongst the Christians. 
He was a man of great works. We see him resisting. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. He was a great defender of the faith. We see him there again in verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He was the first deacon. We saw that in verse 5. As he's mentioned first. And also he was the first martyr. We carry on to the end of the chapter. Uh, chapter 7 verses 59 and 60. And they stoned Stephen. Calling upon God and saying. Lord Jesus receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried out. With a loud voice. Lord lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this. He fell asleep. So we see how he was the first martyr of the church he was a man full of faith and power doing great works for god a man who defended the faith a man who stood against fierce opposition and a man of great communion surrounded by the lord's presence verse 15 and all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel we see god's grace and, and, and shining shining out of him but back to our text in verse 8 it says and stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people that word faith uh, is grace in in the best of the greek manuscript so the two are interchangeable and it's probably accurate since stephen's great faith has already been mentioned he was full of grace and by grace, it is meant that he was full of God's love, God's favour, God's gift and blessings. He was a godly person. He was gracious. He had a great character and behaviour. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we read there, it says, I thank my God always on our, be on our behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance, and in all knowledge we see that the grace of god comes upon even us so we can be just like stephen there he was full of power the power of the holy spirit the holy spirit that we possess as saved people that same power that stephen had is within us today he did great wonders and miracles god's grace and power were upon him both grace and power the holy spirit that we have are necessary before a person can serve God effectively you can't serve God until you're saved and you have that Holy Spirit within you note all that also that Stephen was a deacon and a layman he was a dynamic example that should challenge all of us to be like Stephen Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases stephen was doing the same things because of the authority that god had given him through that holy spirit with inside him we've seen verses 9 and 10 he says then there arose certain of the synagogue which is called the synagogue of the libertines and the cyrenians and the alexandrians of them of cilicia and asia disputing with stephen and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake the three major points here the first one is that stephen preached in several of the synagogues throughout jerusalem all the synagogues listed are grecian by names sometime around ad 19 the roman emperor uh, tiberius had expelled all the jews from rome Many of them had returned to their homeland, some settling in Jerusalem. Uh, and when they returned, because of their common languages and cultures, they clung together, starting in their own worship centres or synagogues. Same as we see today in different churches from different nations and cultures. They'll gather together because they have a common language, a common culture and a common heritage. And I think that's a wonderful thing about Ebenezer, though, is that we have so many of these different cultures and languages uh, and we all come together because we're equal and we're all children of god it's great to see that it's a wonderful wonderful thing but the point to see is that this dynamic layman stephen 
grasped every opportunity he could to preach. He went to all these different synagogues, to all these different people groups, and he preached the same gospel to each one. Because what each one needed was the gospel message. It doesn't matter where they were from. But they opposed what he was preaching. And there was a strong reason for the opposition of the Grecian Jews. They and their forefathers had been forcibly deported out of their homeland, scattered throughout the world by the Romans, and then sent, sent packing again. And while living in these foreign lands of the world, they had remained faithful to their Jewish religion, so they considered themselves uh, quite important. And the message of Jesus Christ was a threat to them and their religion that they had clung to so dearly. For example, Stephen was preaching that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God sacrificed for the sins of the world animal sacrifice sacrifices that you are doing therefore they're no longer needed jesus christ is the mediator between man and god and man was now to worship god in spirit and in truth through christ and him alone so therefore your earthly priests they're no longer mediators who stand between you and god they are the ministers and servants of god to the flock, but not mediators. He was really challenging what they held to. A Grecian Jew saw that the preaching of Jesus as the supreme sacrifice and mediator went against everything they had been taught and stood for. They did not see Jesus as the fulfillment of the law, nor as the liberator of man. They saw him as the destroyer of the law and of everything that they held precious. Therefore, they stood up and they argued against Stephen. Note the picture. They stood up right in the middle of Stephen's preaching and began to dispute him. The picture is that they did this several times. We see in verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. So they were not able to resist, and it sounds like it was done a number of times. Stephen was filled with wisdom and with the Spirit of God in defending his faith. Note the exact words of Scripture. They disputed with Stephen. They were able to resist and to argue with him from their worldly standpoint. But they were not able to resist the wisdom and the Spirit by which he spoke now they could stand against stephen but they could not stand against the holy spirit who was in him and speaking through him the holy spirit was supplying the answers the thoughts and the words to stephen to speak in answer to what they were saying it says in luke chapter 21 verse 15 for i will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, and I think that's a lot of it in, in scriptural terms, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. Something I pray to God regularly for, for wisdom and knowledge the things of God. Saul of Tarsus, who was to become the great apostle Paul, was probably probably a member of the Libertine or the Cilician synagogue because Saul was from Tarsus of Cilicia and was now in Jerusalem. We see Paul in the background quite a lot. We see him here, probably in the background. We see him in Acts uh, when Peter and John were, were being... Um, addressed by the, by the Sanhedrin and imprisoned, uh, we see, see him probably in the background there because he was uh, he came under Gamaliel, who, who was in that prison. So we see him quite a bit in the background. However, he also he had also been born as a freed man, so he could have been a member of the Libertine uh, synagogue, which in Latin uh, it, it means freed man, uh, a son or the son of a freed man. Uh, uh, you know, which where we get our word liberty from. Most likely he was one of those who suffered defeat in arguing with Stephen and became so hostile against him. 
Because remember, Saul of Tarsus was very hostile at the start. And Paul was certainly aware of the message Stephen preached, because he was the one who took charge of Stephen's murder at, right at the end. So men are, often do stand against believers, but the man who opposes and argues against the believer's witness is not resisting the man. He's resisting the Holy Spirit and calling God a liar. Acts chapter 7 verse 51, we read, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And Peter said, not Peter, King David said this in Psalm chapter 32. He said, Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with a bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrow shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. It's great to hear, hear, hear things in, in Psalms that give you such a picture uh, uh, in your mind uh, of the thought process and what is being said. So the Holy Spirit gives the genuine believer the thoughts and the words to, to, to say in bearing witness to the world. But note, not every witness is of the Spirit. A person must be under the control of the Spirit as Stephen was. We read this before, John 14 verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Look at verses 11 to 14. They said, Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him into the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this, this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us. See, Stephen was a man who was fiercely persecuted and resisted. The synagogues were so angered at Stephen that they bribed men to lie against him. That's not the first time the Jews have done that. They stirred up the people and the leaders against him. They arrested and dragged him to court before the Sanhedrin, putting him on trial for his life through lies and deceit and the railings of men. But look at this. The word stirred up means to shake as a volcano, to move and rock together as with a violent shaking. This was the first time the people themselves were aroused uh, uh, fighting against the disciples. The word came upon him means that they rushed to him in fury, anger and violence, trying to shut him up so that people wouldn't hear. The word caught means to seize with much violence. The picture is that they seized him and literally dragged him to the court to shut him up, even hold, probably holding their hands over his mouth to stop him witnessing and speaking. The charges against Stephen were threefold. It was blasphemy against the temple. The Jews had always taught that God dwelt in the temple. We get that from the Old Testament. The temple was the very centre of his presence. Stephen was preaching that God now dwelt in the heart and the lives of people and not just in the temple. The hearts of God's people were now the very special place where God's presence dwelt. God does not fill the temple, he says. In fact, he fills the whole earth 
with his presence in the hearts of his saints. But now Jesus Christ has made it possible for God to fill the hearts of men with that presence of his spirit and his presence is permanent. The believer's body can now become the temple of the Holy Spirit, not the temple in Jerusalem. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through to 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Stephen was not saying that God no longer dwells in the temple. God does dwell in his church, and the church are his people, sanctified and set apart from, uh, for him. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 17 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God... Him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Do you get that? You're the temple of God. You are holy. And if any man destroys you, God's going to destroy him. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And what argument hath the temple, sorry, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. God is your God and you are his people. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, Ephesians chapter 2, 21 and 22 says, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Do you get that last piece? You are built up as the habitation of God through the Spirit. He was also up for blasphemy against the law. And by the law, the Jews meant the scribal law. All the commentaries and interpretations of the scripture as well as the Old Testament or the Tanakh as they had. Stephen was preaching that Christ fulfills the law. That God's law is not destroyed but is now fulfilled by Christ. It's come to an end. Christ is now the ideal, the pattern, the standard which we are to follow. The law is not erased, it's not annulled. The law is now found and embraced in the life of Christ. Man's standard is the law and much more. He adds to the law. But it is the living Lord himself that is the law. He fulfills and embraces the law and much more. Man's standard now is no longer just pre prohibitations and commandments. It's no longer uh, just writing and words. Man's standard is now the life of God himself. The embodiment of love and liberty as well as of law and demands. Look at Romans chapter 3 verses 31 to 32. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. He was also condemned for the preaching about the destruction of the temple and the Jewish customs. And this is just a repeat of the above. The emphasis is that Jesus of Nazareth, who was to destroy the temple, and the customs of the people. That's who he was preaching about. The point is to note that these charges were false. They got false witnesses and they rolled up uh, the people against him. Stephen was preaching that Christ 
fulfills man's need for God and salvation. Christ fulfills those needs. He fulfills the man's need for God's presence abundantly fulfilled in, in Christ. Through Christ, God now lives in the very hearts and lives of believers. Man needs to know how to live abundantly fulfilled in Christ. He embraces all the law and much more, and by such he is now the standard of God for all men. Remember, Christ is the fulfilment of the law. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. It's like getting a jar with the law and the prophets within it. And then Jesus Christ comes along and he's the lid that seals it and finishes it, and keeps it all together. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 says, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son is the likeness, sorry, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Look at verse 15, it says there, and all that sat in the, in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been, the face of an angel. I want you to know that all the council members saw God's presence upon Stephen's face. The word face of an angel refers to some splendor, some glow, some shining radiance, some glory from God that was present, with, present within Stephen that they could see shining out. Just like Moses in Exodus chapter 34, in verse 30, it says, And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses when he came down the mountain of Sinai, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him, because Moses had been in the presence of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, it says, But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to, be, was to be done away. The glory that Moses had. And it was experienced by Christ as well. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. Christ was, trans, uh, was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. We also see Luke chapter 9, verse 29. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. The thing for us to realise when we study and look at Stephen here is that he was a man of such great faith that he held within, within him the power of the Holy Spirit and allowed it to come out of his mouth, out of his voice, out of his teaching, out of his words, that it seemed as if his whole face shone but from the power of God. But that same Holy Spirit and that same power that Stephen had is still within us today. We are able to do the same things as Stephen. When the world comes against us, lies about us, drags us into the courts, tries to stop us from preaching, tries to stop us from giving out the gospel message, we sh they, should be, they should be able to see us shining like the Holy uh, with the power, that power of the Holy Spirit because we're witnessing them, we're giving out the gospel message despite the persecution and the lies that are placed upon us. So the question to ask ourselves, is our life like the life of Stephen? Can we say that when trouble comes along, we can stand and preach the gospel message just like Stephen, knowing that it could cause us trouble and possibly even death?
I hope this message was a blessing to you. Sunday the 28th, back in church. Palm Sunday. Also, don't forget, we put the clocks forward. So don't be late to church. I hope to see you then. God bless. Take care.